get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Mark C. Winters, co-author with Gino Wickman, the business bestseller, Rocket Fuel, the one essential combination that will get you more of what you want from your business. He's been a leader and entrepreneur for over 25 years and has worked with companies ranging from multi-billion dollar enterprises like Procter & Gamble and British Petroleum to raw startups originally drawn up on a napkin. I love the word raw startups. Mark, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Jeremy. Nice to be here. I want to, I mean, we're going to dig deep into rocket fuel and I'm interested in in you analyzing my score, your score, Dan Cashel's score. I want to thank Dan Cashel, CEO of Genius Network, has built huge companies as well for introducing us and you know tell me about some of the raw startups so i mean literally tell me a good raw startup story yeah so well the first raw startup was actually in college and i was working in a clothing store and i wanted to find a way you hear people talking about gee how can you find a way to do what you love and get people to pay you for it and so the thing i loved at the time was water skiing Hmm. And so I'm like, Gee, how can I, how can I figure out a way? So I had these water skiing magazines and I'm thinking, you know, I'll give lessons, I'll do whatever. So in the clothing store, uh, the guy that owned it, he took my water skiing magazine back into his office while I'm working one day and he comes out and he, he throws it down and he had circled an ad for a parasail. You know what a parasail is? Mm-hmm, yeah. Well, tell people if, in case they don't know. So, yeah. so a parasail is basically think of like a parachute canopy that has some vents in it, some holes in it that you can tow behind a, a, a boat in this case, you know, you can tow them behind other things yeah. and it, and it goes up, it flies, it goes up. So you can kind of fly from this parachute. So that's what it, what it was. This was early, early days. So this was probably mid eighties. And so there weren't very many peri sales that, that you were seeing. You didn't see them like you, you kind of see them at resorts right. now. You can go to a resort and go on the beach and they take you up there. Yeah. E- exactly. In a really cool controlled kind of a thing now. So, yeah. So imagine that. So, so, so here's what happened. He goes, he goes, Hey, I've got an idea. He goes, let's buy this. Let's buy one of these things. And it was like 500 bucks or something. You could order one of these things. He goes, I've got a boat. Uh, you'll run it. You know, we'll be partners and blah, blah, blah. We'll make this thing go. Well, we order this thing and about 30 days later, a box shows up and it's this giant box, right? That's got a parachute all in there. And on top, there's a, like a, you know, Xerox copied pamphlet, about 10 pages. That's all the instructions there are in this whole thing. There's no video, there's no nothing. And so I'm like, huh, okay, I look at the pictures and there's diagrams and I, and I basically get his boat. I go by the fraternity house and I'm like, Hey guys, who wants to go parasailing? And so I get about eight guys, and uh, they come rolling. Were out they drinking? That's they, why well, they, 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 so they said was, yes. <laughs> yeah, it was actually early in the day, but they were up for anything. Okay. So uh, we, we go out to the lake, and we find kind of a big grassy area that goes off into the water, get the boat positioned where it's kind of right by the shore, and I'm literally laying out the lines and stuff on the grass, the ropes, and getting this thing kind of spread out. I've got the, you know, the, the, the sheets of paper in one hand, and I'm kind of directing these guys to kind of spread out. I strap myself into this thing, still with the papers in my hand. I'm saying, okay, you hold on to this, and you hold on to that, and, and okay, you, know, you guys are going to run down the shore, and then you know, hopefully I'll be up in the air before we run out of land. And I kind of tossed the paper aside and I said, hit it. And the guy hits it with the boat motor and off he goes. And I'm running down the shore and about, you know, two feet before I get off into the water, uh, I'm still not quite up. And I kind of drag off into the water for a little bit. And then finally, whoop, you know, it takes me up into wow. the air. The guys are all standing on the shore watching this thing go. And, uh, and here I go flying. So I'm flying this thing. And, uh, this sounds really dangerous, by the way. Yeah, so I'm, I'm probably, I don't know, a couple of hundred, maybe 300 feet in the air. And, and this thing's on the back of the boat. And all of a sudden, phew, the, the rope tears loose from oh the back God. of the boat. <laughs> so, and I have no idea what's going to happen now, right? And so fortunately, it did act kind of like a parachute and drops me oh, down really? gently. And uh, they recovered me and I, I lived to, to tell the story. But, you know, raw startup. I mean, literally, That's a that's, failed 
rope startup right there. That's that's kind of the feel of it, though, right? You don't know what you're doing. You kind of <laughs> have some instruction, and you're just kind of running along. You're trying to get people to help you, and it's sort of the thrill and excitement, and the don't know what's going to happen of it all. That's that's part of the charge. So that was my first startup, and we actually we made a buck or two, but it was no it was no big home run. I'm glad you survived. It was fun. Actually, yeah, I lived. That's a good metaphor for entrepreneurship, actually. Um, so. What was the next raw startup? I, I was reading Cyber Explorer. Yeah. Cyber so Explorer was in 1995. Yeah, so tell so, me what that was like. So uh, I was actually at the time, or originally I was employed by Procter & Gamble and I was in business school at the University of Chicago. Yeah. And so I was sort of in the P&G army, right? And I'm watching these different teams come through and do their team projects in a marketing class or whatever. And, you know, somebody would have, here's this widget they've invented that, you know, meets this need. Or here's some new service uh, concept that they've come up with that meets this unmet need. And I thought, man, that is just so much more interesting than what I'm doing. Uh, I need to I need to start my own business. I need mm. to figure I had no idea what I was going to do. You mean you were thinking at the time... This Procter and Gamble thing's boring compared to what the startup scene is. I, I was thinking the first, the rest of my life was going to look exactly like it did then, except more and bigger, right. and, and that didn't really do it for me. Yeah. And and so just something about the you know the rawness, the the unknown of of a startup world and the entrepreneurial world was very appealing to me. It really scratched an itch that I was having. Mm -hmm. So you know the big question was was what I was going to do and. There was this thought in the back of my mind that, you know, as long as I'm sort of safe and, and holding on to p and I don't know that I'm going to be able to really dive into the next thing. Yeah. So the answer to that problem in my simple brain was, well, you need to quit. And so I quit. I Were you resigned. married at the time or no? Yes. So get this. So yeah. we actually lived in Milwaukee. I quit with my boss in Chicago. I drive home to Milwaukee and tell my wife what I just did. <laughs> oh, gosh. A after the fact. Uh, by the way, my wife was, oh, eight months pregnant at the time wow. with our first child. Yeah, so real interesting. I don't recommend that be the way to do it, uh, you know, but she's still my wife, so that's a win. Uh, so what'd so, she tell you when you showed she, up and told her? She was like, you better have a, figure out a way to make this work. <laughs> And and so I kind of started on the quest to figure out what the what the business would be. Right? I want to hear about what, so what's going through your head to make you quit at that moment? It, it was a total uh, feeling that I wasn't in control. And there, there actually was another incident that happened where, where I was having dinner with uh, my, my manager. And uh, we had a senior executive coming into the, one of the marketplaces that I was responsible for. And so we were talking about, you know, how to plan for that visit. And, you know, really, the feeling was we were kind of going to set this guy up. We were kind of going to make things appear to be much better than they actually were on a day-to-day -day basis. And that just wasn't sitting real well with me. Mm. And so I sort of challenged it a little bit. I'm kind of like, you know, why don't we let him see what's really going on? Because we need some help. We need some support on pricing. We need some support in terms of these resources. And the response I got from this guy was, uh, Mark, don't F with me. Hmm. And I mean, he just, he looks across the table and he tells me that. And it's like it just all kind of flashed before my eyes because the politics of it all, hmm. I realized that it just took one, one move like that and somebody could essentially kind of block my career path. Yeah. And, and that just felt really helpless yeah. to me. And, 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 and so that was, that was going around the back of my mind that coupled with, wow, that looks way more interesting and fun and exciting. Yeah. I'm like, you know, I need to make a move. And so yeah. that was the trigger. So how do you translate that to your wife though? Who's eight months pregnant when you come yeah, home? Well, she, she had heard some of that story and, okay. uh, but, but the, the reality is you're right. I couldn't. And, and, you know, I'm wired in a certain way where I, I have the feeling that I can always make it. And uh, even if I get in big trouble, I'm always going to be able to figure a way to kind of pull it out. I'd never had somebody else that I had to kind of be concerned about. And that's sort of evident in the way I approached it. I didn't think about right. uh, the, the fact that everybody else isn't wired the same way as I am and other yeah. people that are attached to me or, or may not be. Yeah. So it's really tough for her. And, and so she, you know, went through the, the, the sort of the fear and the frustration and all the things that you it's might like expect the stages of grief. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, imagine if you hated roller coasters and all of a sudden somebody grabbed you and threw you in the front car and right. said, let's go. And the next thing you know, you're off on the ride that you didn't sign up for. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of the yeah. feeling that I, I think she must have yeah. had. Yeah. I mean, we're going to talk about, you know, rocket fuel and the integrator visionary. And I don't want to jump the gun because I want to hear what happened, what you did next, but I'm so curious now 
your wife has probably taken the score or the the, ta- the assessment. You, right? you know, Jeremy, she has not. But she has not. Oh, we she have to get not. her taking that. Yeah, that's actually a good idea. I, yeah, because I, 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 I wanted I, to see what she, you know, because you said it's like grabbing someone on a roller coaster who doesn't like roller coasters. I'm really curious of what her her score is. Yeah, that's this. actually a really good question. I, I'll do that. See, I knew I'd get a good question at least yeah. once, right, in the beginning. <laughs> you got it out early, too. Good job. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so you tell her this. So what do you do next? She's like, you better figure something out. Yeah, exactly. You you better make this work. And you know, on on the one hand, she was very supportive and you know, sort of betting on me. I mean, she she believed in me, and it seemed well, she like, married you. She yeah, she bet she had, had to had to believe in some part of me at least. Uh, but you know, I mean, there's a there's a certain amount of pressure there that you're feeling from the from the jump to to kind of make it go, which yeah. I think was uh, you know subconsciously at least I, that's part of what I wanted in making the break right so so i've got to make it work yeah. and there's not this distraction of you know some other uh, career that i'm i'm committing to and somebody else that i've got to you know i've got to do what they tell me to so it was a full court press to figure it out i was mm. fortunate to have one of my professors that sort of let me consult with him for a little while while i sort of looked for my my muse my inspiration mm. for what the idea would be so I got to travel around and make a buck or two in that process. And I, I landed on, and I was sort of drawn to coffee shops. And one of the things that had happened in Chicago, uh, and again, this was... Yeah, which early, is where I am. So, yeah. Which is where you are. Yeah. Now. All right. So, so imagine this. So in early uh, the early 1990s, yeah. uh, you know, I was there. Uh, again, you know, I'd be there for school. Come, I was flying in when I started. And Starbucks was new on the scene. So I'd never been to a Starbucks before. Yeah, I love guys. hearing about the landscape. But that's why this intrigued me because I knew you'd have some good stories from yeah. this. Yeah. So, so you know, there was a Starbucks or two down around Michigan Avenue downtown, and, and yeah. you know, the guys would go uh, to Starbucks, and and I'd never been, and so one day they talked me into going with them, and so you, they walk in, and I remember I walked in for the first time, and you got to remember, you know, I'm basically a country kid from Oklahoma. And so I've gone from Oklahoma to, to Kansas City, and now I'm flying into Chicago. And, and so, you know, this big city stuff was kind of new to me. And I walk in there, and I look at the menu boards, and I'm listening to these people throwing around these, you know, macchiato, you know, grande, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. And I have no idea what they're talking I about. I still don't, so it's okay. Yeah. So, so we can relate. Yes. And, and so, you know, I finally figure out something kind of safe that I can order that – Kind of sounds like I'd write, hot, give me the hot chocolate. No, yeah, <laughs> they had a different word for that, I think, but uh, I, I ended up basically with hot chocolate and coffee, so something that they called a mocha, right? The mocha latte, and so that was something I had that tasted pretty good. So I never changed it once I kind of got that dialed in. So every time I would go in, I'd order my grande mocha latte, and uh, and I really, really liked it, so I kind of got hooked to it, right? So, but then we, I'd go home to Milwaukee when I was living in Milwaukee and I, I, I liked my Starbucks that I was getting in Chicago and I couldn't find it in Milwaukee. And so that really would frustrate me. So I thought, oh, there's my idea. I'll call Starbucks and I'll bring Starbucks into Milwaukee. So I call Starbucks. So how many at this time, was it all over? I mean, where, how global so is listen to their Listen to their answer. So, okay. so I said, hey, I'd, I'd like to bring uh, Starbucks into Milwaukee. What do you think? I don't even know who I was talking to. Somehow I got in. Howard I Schultz. Yeah, probably yeah. his name was Howard, I think. <laughs> and and basically the response was, you know, a uh, you know we have no interest in Milwaukee. We're in Chicago, New York, San Francisco, Seattle, uh, maybe Dallas. So I mean, it was kind of that was it. So it was kind of top tier cities. That's the only places they were at that point in time. Mm-hmm. And literally Milwaukee or whatever that next tier of cities was not even on their radar. So that was point one. Point two was, oh, by the way, when we do get ready, we don't need your help. Uh, so we, <laughs> we can handle we can handle this this coffee business uh, quite well on our own. Thank you. So I sort of took that as a little jab, and I decided, well, you know what? I think I can do it. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll tee it up in Milwaukee. I'll lock up the best sites. And that way, when they decide to hit Milwaukee, which at some point they will, they'll have to deal with me because I'm going to have <laughs> best locations, right? That's my idea. Right. So, you know, it's not free to get a retail location. So I start looking at, all right, how am I going to make this work? How can I differentiate? And I found it was a really interesting puzzle. So I like the margins in the business, but differentiating, it was just really kind of challenging. It wasn't clear to me. And then I landed on a thing called the SF Net in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And it was a, a network of these little coffee houses where they had taken a bulletin board system. You remember bulletin boards? 
And they had built these little cases out of like plywood that they'd put a computer monitor in. I think it had quarter slots mostly. And you'd like put a quarter in and it would let you get on and you could get on. And really? Do this. Well, yeah. Oh, wow. And so, and they were networked together across these, you know, 20 or 25 different locations that were in San Francisco. And I thought that's cool. They're bringing technology into the picture. So that's different. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're finding a way to kind of make that part of the, the economic equation. So that's cool. So I started looking for things like that and I found, uh, another location in England and another location in Australia that were what would later become known as cyber cafes. So they had right. done something to kind of bring a computer in with a coffee shop. So I said, okay, this is cool. This is this is really interesting. I think there's a way to bring something together. So then I found basically all of the cyber caf cafes in the world, and there was a <laughs> short list. I mean, it was about probably 25 or 30. Yeah, About eight of them were in Canada. And there was hmm. one in uh, in Boston, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and in uh, and in New York. There was one in New York, Manhattan. And so I load up my car and a video camera, and I'm going to go on a road trip. I'm going to go to all these, and I'm going to gather as much information as I can, and I'll come back and I'll write the business plan for the ultimate cyber cafe. Hmm. So hop in my car and I start driving across Canada. I would go in and I would I would you know kind of look at how it was set up. I'd talk to the customers and ask them why do you come here and you know hmm. did you go to any place before this? This what is hardcore like? market research. And it was yeah. it was boots on. It was that field study, right? Yeah. And and I would talk to the owners. You know what's working, what's not. I would you know videotape the thing and take pictures and kind of take the best from all of them. So I went to all these. So I went to twelve different ones, and literally came home and sat down and wrote the business plan. So this was the first business that I. I had done where I needed to go raise money. So yeah. it was the first kind of money raising business plan. And I started talking to people and, you know, I talked to somebody and they'd go, yeah, I want to hear about it. Oh yeah. Well, that sounds really cool. And then I found it was really interesting because the process would kind of get to that point And then it came time to get a check and people would just sort of fall away. You know, so there's a, a huge gap. Between They're like, I'll buy a coffee there, but I'm not going to give you a check to. Uh, yeah. yeah, or they just to wanted to it. talk. They wanted to talk about business. They wanted to. They wanted to hear the business plan. They wanted to hear what the idea was. Right. But you know, to put money in it was just a, a a leap. So you know, but they would introduce me to more people, and so the you know the one person became four people, became sixteen people, and it just kind of grew like that. So eventually, I was able to you know raise the money. You to, were wow. Yeah, and uh, how much money did you? need to open a cyber cafe you know we ended up raising about a half a million bucks and uh, you know the the money went to the the design of the place so imagine a 2500 square foot place that had 20 uh computer workstations uh that all had 20 inch monitors we wow had, that's it, that's amazing it was big right uh, they had Pentium 133s, which back then that was the the latest and greatest. Wow. We had we had CUC me cameras on all of them, so you could kind of do the the video conferencing in between. Not as well as we do now, but it was the early stages of that. Yeah, and and I had a T1 line. And so it was blazing fast. And, you know, people had literally 14.4, 28.8 kind of modems at home. So they didn't know what the experience of the Internet was, if they even knew what the Internet was, like, like they could have it when they came into our place. Yeah. The, the idea was let's bring together the social component uh, so that you could literally have people come in and do cool stuff with each other. But what I saw was we literally spanned generations. So you'd have a grandparent come in with a grandchild yeah. and we built these booths where they could kind of sit around the monitor and it was real social in its design. And you've got, you know, the grandchild showing grandpa, Hey, you know, look at this. And grandpa's like learning from the little kid. <laughs> and I mean, it was, it was fascinating to watch how people interacted with that environment. So how, what happened? How did it go from there? Yeah. So do you have any of those stories about what not to do in business and what, uh, you know, I'll let you uh, take it from here. Perhaps not to stack <laughs> it and all that. So, so, you know, the, the road to raise money is hard. Yeah. Very hard. Yeah. You hit these points where it's kind of like, man, I've got a, it's sort of a chicken or an egg point. And so you, you, I'm, I'm looking for the space. I'm looking for the retail space. I need to sign a lease. I don't have the money pinned down, but I need to commit to the lease or I'm going to lose it. And you get these things where it's just kind of, you just kind of got to take some, take some leaves. Yeah. So and many so, moving parts here. There really, there really were. I mean, it was really confusing uh, for a, you know, for a first time around. So like, I want to make it really hard on myself. And yeah, exactly. Let's how, how challenging can we possibly make this? <laughs> Let's do that. Let's don't do simple. The parasailing thing sounded very simple <laughs> into this whole thing. Uh, so, you know, I kind of made the jump. So I made the commitment. So I had to make it work again. And so we had most of the money, but not all of the money. And so I really needed the last part of the money. 
And so a, uh, you know, an investor gets brought along by uh, my attorney and this investor had the money and he was interested. And so he, he wanted to come in. And as part of the negotiation, he negotiated some negative control covenants. Do you know what those are? Mm, no. So a, you know, a control covenant would be, you know, I'm going to tell you what to do, right? So a negative control covenant works the other way. Those are the, the provisions where I'm still in control, but this person, because they have those covenants as part of their agreement, they can say no. So they can't make me do anything, but if I want to do anything on this list, they have to agree. If they, if they don't, I can't do it. So it's negative control. Mm. So because I really needed the money, and you know, really, this was the, this was the only like, I, I just want to get it off the ground type and, of thing. Yeah, and so I gave away a lot of negative control covenants. So I, I got into a deep partnership with someone I didn't know very well, and so that's the big lesson. That's the big trap that uh, you know you try not to repeat repeat that mistake. But you fast forward a little bit, and what what happened was, being a good first time entrepreneur, do you think I built in enough working capital? <laughs> What do you think? No. No, you're right. You're very wise, very no. wise. So, so no, I, I, I left myself a little bit short. So we start, we start operating the company and we had a lot of interest, right? So we've got these, you know, multi-generational people coming in. We had gamers coming in because they found on our high speed connection, they could sort of run circles around people that were on a low speed connection somewhere. Mm. So they loved that. Interesting. And, and the, the media absolutely loved us. Anytime the, the local news station wanted to do a story that they could somehow relate to the internet, they would come and shoot it. Uh, at our location. And uh, so we had lots of interest, but you know, the, the money just wasn't quite there. And one of the things I know is we built a software where people could order from their computer. So, you know, they could not only manage their usage account, we started off charging, I think 29 and a half cents a minute for access to the system, but they could order their coffee. They could order, cause we basically had a full wow. Starbucks like uh, cafe in there Jeez. and it was all part of the thing. So it was a really pretty slick interface. Yeah. And, and what I saw, though, was people would log on and they would do whatever they were going to do online and then they'd log off. And, and it was like I could see this clock running in their head where they didn't want to be wasting the 29 and a half cents a minute. So they weren't engaging as freely as I wanted. Right. So I kind, of, kind of sat back and thought, you know, all right, well, how could we loosen that up? How could we get them to play more and engage more? And the idea I came up with was if you looked at it generically, this model was a lot like a health club. Okay, we have expensive machines that people didn't know how to use. They could come in, somebody could kind of <laughs> right. help them, show them, they could interact, right. right? It just had a lot of the same kind of characteristics to me that a fitness center had. Right. And so I thought, okay, great. How does a fitness center price? And the answer was memberships, yeah. right? So you could buy a membership and then use it all you want. So it's like, okay, why don't we do that? What if we had a membership, a good idea. Yeah. membership for a day or a week or a month or whatever? And, and let's see what happens. So we did that and we started off with that. And that was the answer, man. I mean, they just started rolling in. And so literally on a weeknight, we'd have people lined up four or five deep at each station, you know, wow. wait on, you've got people on there and they're just using. So now the place is packed. And it's just rolling. So, okay, basic economics here. If I have more demand than I have supply, what should I do? More computers. No, nah, raise the price. Oh, raise the price. Okay. Raise, raise the price. So we raised the price. We effectively. <laughs> I would have gone out and took you out of business. <laughs> doubled the price. Yeah, you would have. Glad, glad I didn't ask you that. <laughs> so, so we doubled the price. And what do you think we saw happen to demand? You doubled the price? Doubled the price. Demand stayed the same. Well. Wow. So, I mean, it just jumped. So that was the answer. So we're on the right curve, but it's taken a little while to figure this out. So all that time we're figuring out, we're, we're burning through that working capital that I didn't have quite enough of. And literally we're coming right down to the end. We're this close to break even cash flow. Okay. So we're yeah. about to start not using up the working capital, but adding back to it, Yeah. but I'm out. And, and I'm basically out of money. And so out of money, the options that we saw were, all right, we could take on more investment. We could take on more debt. And both of which we had those options available. So I had people who were basically asking all the time, hey, can we buy into this thing? Can we put some money into this thing? Or the bank's like, hey, you guys are great. You know, we'll be happy to, to lend you more because of the way that, that the business was kind of uh, ramping. So great, we're going to do this. We're going to you know, take on a little bit more debt. Go to my partner, the 13th partner. That's going to be the name of a book someday, the 13th partner. The 13th partner. And the 13th partner says, no. Mm. What the do you negative mean? control guy? Negative control covenant guy says, yeah. no, 
And so that shocked me that, that no is the answer. It's like, well, what do you mean no? Well, no, I don't want to do that. Well, no, you don't want us to make it. No, you don't want us to, you know, well, I don't get it. Well, no, I just don't want to, I don't agree to that. Okay, so what, do you want us to buy you out? And the answer was no. And well, do you want to buy that's us out? That's why he's called the negative guy. He just yeah, knows yeah. the answer to everything. That's, that's, the, that's the theme. And he says, no, he doesn't want to buy us out. And so it left me, it boxed in this really weird yeah. kind of space where I couldn't get money into the structure to, to go to the next level. I couldn't really get out of it. I was just kind of stuck. And so we, we tried a couple of different things and even went so far as to uh, you know, look at a solution where we'd form another company, uh, go to the bank and say, bank, I'll take over all those liabilities if you'll transfer all those assets over to me. The bank said, okay. Uh, but the 13th investor contacted the bank and threatened them. And then the bank says, you know what? We're not getting in the middle of this. Uh, we can't do it. So pay us our money, please. And so that led to what I think is one of the first uh, uh, online auctions. So you know we couldn't make this thing go. So it's time to time to shut it down. And literally, we we sold off all the stuff on the internet, and uh, you know had one of the the toughest days of my life when uh, my 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 poor wife, uh, who now has our you know one, two year old son uh, kind of in tow and is pregnant with our second one. Wow. Uh, comes with me down to the down to the shop one night to to sit in front of everybody and go okay guys you know show's over we got to shut it down it's not gonna it's not gonna happen and we got to sell all this stuff off and you know, so try you had to, make- to sell the equipment and everything yep yep sold it all off oh that's tough yeah and set it down yeah so uh, you know that was the the raw harsh reality of you know what can happen when you don't. And, and I mean, count the mistakes I made. I mean, there were there were you know many, uh, but uh, you know you're getting some traction there. Oh so, yeah, I mean, it's, just, it's just a little bit ahead of its time. So why do you think that guy just wanted it to collapse? Jeremy, I have the most frustrating thing is I have no good answer for it. Yeah, and and I mean I really don't. It's just it's just not rational. Hmm. And so I've heard lots of different bizarre theories, uh, yeah. but at the end of the day, the reality is I didn't know him well enough to know what the motive was. It wasn't a purely financial motive. There has to be something else going on there. Um, So. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. That's not a good ending, but a great story and learning. So on the flip side of that, Mark, what's been something that actually was, you consider one of your big successes? company. Yes. Was. So, so, uh, great one here. So after, after the, the cyber cafe deal, I, yeah. I actually got hired by Amico Petroleum to be what, uh, they would call an entrepreneur in residence. Mm. Okay. And very cool job. Right. So basically I got to use their money and break all their rules and, that sounds and, good. and, and try and challenge the big stodgy. How uh, did you land that? So literally, uh, that story about the, the cyber cafe, that was it. Mm. So, so, so that's the, that's the upside, right? It's the, it's the, the going through that. And then somebody that appreciates somebody who's been through an experience like that and yeah. the, the learning that, that they've taken, yeah. they, they want, they see value in that. And, yeah. and, and so I think that's the upside to it. So, so that was it because of that, boom, you know, let's bring him in and have him help break our stuff down and, and see how we could be more entrepreneurial as this giant corporation. So go in and do that. And I, I built this team that I had about 75 people wow. uh, working for me, only two of which were employees of Amico. Really? All, all the rest were virtual. And so did think you about find them? This. How did you find yeah. them? Yeah. So yeah. I tracked them down. I was just looking for who's best, who's best at this or that. And I had people that were real estate people. I had engineers. I had environmental people. I had data people. I had all these different kinds of people. And just trying to assemble the best really virtual team. So Because I, I, I appreciated the idea of not having these long-term commitments, not having to uh, you know commit large amounts of capital and wanting to be able to move really fast. Right. So uh, in that assembly of that group one of the guys that I brought in was a uh, he was a, a scientist that had built these predictive models hmm. for how to how to pick the best real estate for whatever your concept is wow. and he was a he was a professor at TCU in Fort Worth and he literally Jeremy was a rocket scientist so he is one of the guys that was uh, when when NASA first when before they sent a uh, you know a, a rocket to the moon with with people in it they sent probes to the moon to make sure they could hit it. 
Okay, good idea, right? Before yes. we send a, yes. a living person up there, let's unlike sure. parasailing. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a forethought. The funny part is the first probes missed, <laughs> so so they actually missed a few times before they they hit it. But this guy, he was involved in writing the guidance system. Uh, for being able to hit the moon. So wow. smart, smart guy. So I bring him in to help me in Amico. And the whole idea was let's use, uh, let's use science, let's use technology, let's use analytics to help us make smarter business decisions. And I found out that that was a really powerful approach there. Hmm. So fast forward a bit, and there's a couple other businesses and other interesting things in between, but we want to get to a big win. Yeah. And, and, and one of the coolest ones was I had Exited a company, done very well based on, uh, you, you know, sort of cashing that deal out, another one that we had grown. And so I'm looking for the next thing. And at this point, I'm living wherever I want in the country, and I happen to choose Dallas to live in. And I run into him, and it's kind of like, man, this is a really smart guy. Uh, he was sort of stuck in this consulting based business model where he had kind of a clunky client server. Uh, software. He was the expert, so he could draw people to it. But by the time they got more than three or four clients, they just sort of fall under the weight of trying to support them all. So they didn't have a good, good infrastructure, a very scalable model. Well, the stuff I had been doing was all in the early days of sort of software as a service. Yeah, where we would build these big. I mean, this is really systems. early days. This is like yeah. late nineties, right? Yeah, it's exactly right. Yeah. And so I, I understood that model and, and, I, and I knew there was value in his application because I'd been a client. And so the discussion was, hey, why don't we take your smarts and put it together with, with kind of how I see we could, we could build this model and let's start a new company. And so we did and we brought in a couple of other folks to, to partner up with us that were experts in you know, a software person and a mapping person and, and, and so forth and started a company called uh, Prediction Analytics. Yeah. And that was the focus is we were going to provide uh, you know, intelligent decision support for retailers and restaurants hmm. so that they could make the best decision about where to, where to locate their stores, right? Wow. So basically, the, the, the decision we could help you with is if you've got you know, a McDonald's and you put it on this corner, it'll, it'll you know, deliver you $7 million a year. If you go a mile and a half that way and put it mm. on the other side, it'll do you know, $2 million a year or whatever, whatever the right. difference is. Yeah. And then, then they can use that information along with the underlying cost of the real estate to make the best economic decision to expand their model. Then we could also optimize. So we could tell you in this, in this metropolitan area, here's how many outlets it'll support. So it'll support 50 outlets. So here's the optimal network for maximizing the yield from that market so that mm. they're not so close together that wow. they cannibalize each other, but they're not so far apart right. from each other that they leave demand on the ground. Right. So that was the business. And we, we had really great modeling technology, really, really smart people that, that built really good predictive models. And so we found that a company called Experian, you ever heard of Experian? Yeah. So what do you know? What do you think about when you think of Experian? I just think a big company. I don't, I have no idea what they do. Yeah, so in the U.S., most people default to, oh, credit bureau. Okay. Okay, they're one of the big three credit bureaus. The reality is Experian is one of the largest data companies on the planet. In mm. fact, they're probably one of the largest technology companies on the planet. And they've got data on everything in, you know, like 70 different countries. I mean, it's like just all over the place, right? And they have data on who these people are, on, on the, the, the profiles of these people, you know, sort of the, the segmentation models. There's traffic data, there's consumption data, there's just all this data. So as an analytics company, the data is the fuel, right? So we saw this as a really, really interesting uh, mm. you know, potential partner. And as it turned out, they were in our business outside of the United States. So where we were really focused in the United States, they were focused outside in other countries around the world, but they were yeah. on a, a global search for sort of best of breed technology to solve that modeling problem. And so they, they came to us, they found us, and they sort of put us in a bake-off against, uh, against some of the top retailers on the planet and their team. And you know, as it turned out, our guys were very good and we smoked them. And so wow. that, that ultimately led to a sale of our company to uh, to to Experian, yeah. and it took a long time. You're dealing with a huge, huge, uh, you know, multi billion dollar global company there, and then it's our it's our little little technology company in Dallas on the other end of this thing, uh, you know. But the net of it is, we basically, in the course of 36 months, generated a hundred fold cash on cash return. Wow! So I'll count that as a win. That's a big and, win. And, 
and the technology that we developed in the process was, uh, you know, arguably the best the planet's ever seen. So that was, uh, that was a fun ride. Mark, I think your master plan as I'm hearing this is to just get back at Starbucks. You just created this whole software. Just <laughs> Starbucks comes back to you and goes, where do we put our store? Like, sorry, I can't help you. You wouldn't let me open that store in Milwaukee. That's it. Maybe that's a window into my brain. <laughs> um, so rocket fuel. So at the time, um, I want to get to why you decided to write rocket fuel with Gino. But at that time, what was it like managing the team? What were you like as a leader then? Yeah. So early on, I was probably awful and probably very controlling and micromanaging, didn't develop people, didn't give them clear instruction, set clear expectations. Uh, and, you know, not that I'm, I'm perfect now, but hopefully I'm better. Awful is a strong and, word, but. Yeah, well, it's probably accurate. And, uh, you know, the, the reality is and sort of the, the discovery for me is we're all different. And, and so there are things that I really, really, really enjoy doing. There are things that I'm really good at. And on the other end of that scale, there are things that I'm terrible at, and there are things that sort of suck the life force right out of me if mm -hmm. I'm forced to do them. So the, the shocking discovery for yeah, me was yeah. uh, along the lines of what Dan Sullivan would call unique ability, yeah. you're familiar with that term, yes. you know, that there are some of the things that suck the life force out of me. There are people out there in the world that live to do that stuff. <laughs> I, so what's, I one, what's like one thing... That sucks the life force that you were surprised that someone else actually loves doing it. Just, just detailed, trivial paperwork stuff, right? Yeah. So, I mean, if it's, if it's filling out forms or matching things up or checking this against that, just all the little detailed stuff, uh, it's just brutal. And, you know, and I can do it, which is, is, I think, part of my own personal challenge is because there are things that I can do. Uh, at times I have done them, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, it just against my better judgment. And, and again, it's just, I, I thought that I was helping because I didn't think anybody else liked to do it. And so, you know, the, the, the rosy side of this discovery is, you know, if I keep holding that stuff and doing it, even though I hate it, I'm really uh, depriving someone else out there in the world of doing the thing they love by not, you know, mm -hmm. finding them and passing it off to them and, and letting them do it. Yeah, you were thinking you were saving them because yeah, you hated was, doing it. I thought I was being, yeah. uh, you know, helpful to the team. So your unique ability, how long did it take you to come to? What is your unique ability, and how long did it take you to to figure out what that was? Yeah, so it's still evolving, uh, yeah. but you know, there's there's a couple of different dimensions. You know, one is is I have the ability to see patterns, and so I can see mm. sort of disparate things that that appear to be disconnected and find the connection. So mm. so example the back to the the cyber cafe oh yeah for sure yeah the, the pattern of what that was and, and seeing that wow this is kind of like a health club right so i can see things like that mm. and then you know really my my active unique ability i call it lcd so uh, I, I learning creating and delivering mm. and so you know it's it's my unique ability and my passion to, to i'm curious right so i love learning about you and 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 the stuff that you've got going on and, and the, the interesting people that you get to talk to. Yeah. I think that's fascinating. And, you know, so I'm always kind of curious and kind of picking up other things and, and trying to add to that. And then I like to create. So I see the world in models and tools. Mm. And so things that kind of take whatever is complex and simplify it down to, you know, a matrix or, a, a you know, some kind of a conceptual model that can, uh, you know, help people get their heads around it or help me really organize my thinking around it. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty good at that. And then delivering that. So I'm a teacher at heart. And, and so standing up at the whiteboard and going, all right, let's, let's kind of walk through this and, and interacting and bringing it out of the group and, and getting you know, a group to kind of come to the same place in terms of either solving the problem or clarifying their thinking on uh, you know, whatever the subject might be. You know, that, that collection of things is, is what I consider my unique ability. Yeah. So what made you decide to finally write Rocket Fuel? So, uh, Gino and I got connected and, uh, you know, so that was the start. And so Gino and I got connected now about, uh, three and a half years ago. And it, we found that we had lots of things in common. So, uh, you know, we had both had been involved with the entrepreneurs organization EO for, for many years. Yeah. We, we knew lots of the same people. We, our paths had kind of crossed, but not quite just for, for a number of years. And he had developed this system uh, called EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. Mm -hmm. 
And I had some clients in my private practice that I was working with to, to kind of help them install some form of a system for, for their business. And I loved what he'd put together. So when, when I first met him and saw that, we just became fast friends. I, I really loved his system. So I sort of adopted it to start using with my clients. And as I did that, you know, we had more contact. Our relationship grew. And, I don't know, six months later or so, he floats the idea of doing a book together. Hmm. And so it sounded very exciting to me. I, I'd love to do a project with him. The, the topic was very interesting, very relevant uh, to my experience. And, and so, you know, we, we did a little bit of dancing just to make sure that, you know, we'd be good partners and, right. and get married on a book project because we we're going to have to spend a lot of hours together. And, uh, and then we, we dove in and you know, a short two years later, a book came out. Yeah, it's a tough one. So what was the original title or working title? Yeah, so the, the working, well, one of the original working titles, were it was things like the, you know, the visionary integrator uh, formula, the visionary integrator revelation, the visionary integrator, uh, yeah. you know, revolution. I mean, there were just all these different kinds of things that sort of built in the words visionary integrator. So right. nothing too sexy. Yeah. And I suggest anyone get the book. Uh, I listened to it on an Audible. It's fantastic. It really makes you think about yourself differently, or at least it did for me. And I took the online. Where can people check out if they want to fill out the online uh, assessment? Where can they check so, that out? So if they'll go to rocketfuelnow.com, uh -huh. rock, rocketfuelnow.com, yeah. uh, you know, that, everything, they can get to everything from there. Okay. So you can, you can go right through and take the assessments. There are two assessments, one for the visionary and one for the integrator. Um, so that's sort of the hub. Yeah. So I'm getting a sense of, you know, from your description, obviously from the book of what, what you are, um, just by some of the words you're really? using. And so for, for people who don't know, talk a little bit about the essential combination that will skyrocket your business. And then we can kind of define the two things. Great. So, yeah. so here, here's what we found is, you know, uh, most companies and, and keep in mind, I'm talking about companies that have somewhere between 10 and 250 employees. Yeah. So, you know, we were talking about the raw startups before things started on a napkin. So early on, it's sort of, you know, brute force. It's, you know, one person kind of running the show and kind of making sure that everything happens. You start to get to that size where I've got, you know, a dozen employees and it's the next level. I'm starting to now have to kind of hand some things off and build my team. Yeah. And, and the game changes, right? And so what we've seen in, in our experience is, you know, when that original visionary entrepreneur tries to hold on and, and do all that uh, sort of on their own, there are some things that need to start happening that frankly aren't in their unique ability. Yeah. They're, they're, they're not a good fit with what they're wired to do. Right. And they don't have that member of the team yet. So yeah. we contrast that with a team that has these two comp complementary parts. So they have the visionary leader, but they also have the more execution oriented, more detail oriented leader that we call the integrator. Yeah. And those two combine in a way that, that fits and it forms this super powerful tandem. And so right. when we see that present, in a company, literally mm. the growth growth curve is multiples uh, steeper than mm. what it is when the visionary holds on and tries to do that on their own. So that's yeah. the combination we're talking about. So the book really helps someone identify what they are and what they need to find to rocket to create the rocket fuel for their business. Yeah, I think of the book in sort of three sections. Yeah. One is is to crystallize your thinking around this concept. Yeah. So, okay, I get it. There's a visionary and an integrator. Okay, here's kind of what that looks like. Here's kind of what that might be able to do for me or not, right? I mean, it's not, not forcing it on anybody, but they see that there's value there and they see some of them in that picture. Yeah. Then, the, then the next step is great. If you want one, how do I get connected? So if I'm a visionary, how do I go about looking for my integrator? And so we have a, a seven step connection process to kind of walk people through to help solve that. And then the third piece is, is once we're together, how do we maximize that relationship? Because remember, they're really different. So if we just kind of leave them to their own, there's a lot of friction. There's a lot of headbutting that goes on. So we yeah. have a very, intentional structure that we put them into to make sure that the communication is crystal clear and they're able to get everything that they should out of that relationship. Yeah. So Mark, start with what are some of the traits of an integrator and then traits of a visionary? So think of the integrator as the, as the get it done guy or gal. All right. So, so the visionary throws out this idea. They came up with something, they sort of throw it out there 
And, and the integrator is the one who pulls together. They work harmoniously through and between the other leaders of the team to get everybody on the same page of what needs to be happening, get them all aligned and mm -hmm. point in the same direction, all marching to the same tempo, to the same beat of the drum. They're great at project managing, at follow through. They're great at communication. They're great at resolving the conflicts that come up between the team. Yeah. Uh, they're great at you know the, the little details and just making sure that it actually happens. It actually becomes real. The visionary that threw that idea over in the wall in the first place, hey, what they're great at is having those ideas. So they may have 20 new ideas a week and, you know, 17 of them may be insane. They may be crazy, <laughs> put you out of business like ideas, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. But, you know, a couple of them, one or a couple of them could be just gold. And they're the ones right. that'll just take you to the moon. They'll take you to right. the next level. They're great at big uh, external relationships. So, you know, whether it's the big customers or the big vendors, strategic partners, you kind of trot them in and people just love to be around them. They're the great energy for that. They're great at sort of the big uh, problem solving, big complex problems, not the little mundane trivial ones, but sort of the big massive ones. Uh, you know, they're great at seeing the future. And I, I like to say they, they look down the road, they see where things yeah. are going, right. and then they can help us figure out where should we position our business along that path in the best place to kind of take advantage yeah. of it. So who are the stereotypical duo that we should think about for visionary integrator? Well, uh, how about we take the Disney brothers? Okay, so Walt and Roy. And, you know, everybody knows Walt Disney. Uh, but there's a great quote in some of the research we did for the book where, you know, Roy says, uh, you know, nobody knows about Roy and Roy kind of liked it that way. You know, but he was the guy behind the scenes who was making sure that the money was all taken care of, mm -hmm. making sure that the the operations uh, ran smoothly. In fact, right. Walt was quoted as saying, if it hadn't been for my brother Roy, I, I would have ended up in jail for sure. <laughs> and, and so, you know, very different. Uh, right. But but the power in that combination, uh, just huge. So. Now I obviously have to ask um, your scores. So my scores. So I, I, I thought you might ask this since we had talked about it. And so yeah. I, I went and looked them up. So my visionary score is a 96. Okay. That's exactly. I would have predicted. Yep. Yeah. That, that, would, that would be your guess. Okay, I mean, I guess. didn't know what the score was, but I, I would predict high, very, you know, visionary. Yeah. Yeah. So do you want to guess my other score? I, by your smile, I'm going to guess it's close to the visionary score, but I don't. Oh, really? Yeah. No, 60, 64. Okay. 64. Yeah. So it's, so it's significantly different. Yeah, and, huge difference, and yeah. you know, and I look back on my career and I've done a lot of integrator things. Yeah. Uh, so I'm capable, but here's the thing. Remember I talked about the things that kind of suck the life force out of me. Yeah. It's those things. Yeah. So when I look at the, look at the buckets they're in, I mean, when I'm working on visionary stuff, I'm creating energy. I can keep going, right? Yeah. I don't get tired. Yeah. I could do this forever. It's like time just goes into a flow state. Uh, but if I'm working on the other stuff, oh, you know, I mean, it's just it's just pulling me down. Oh. And and so you know, you've got that you've got that choice. Yeah. And yeah. I happen to be wired in that in that fashion. Yeah, that's why I was going to say the visionary because the thing that sucked the life force out of you was those details, yeah. and that's probably the complete opposite of a visionary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly right. So then let's talk about Dan Cashel. So what do you okay. do? Well, let's talk about you for a second. So what do you do with that information once you you know that now? Yep. So what what can you or someone else do with that? So so step one is it's just kind of a self awareness. And you know here's what's critical: when you're filling out those assessments, you got to be honest, right? So there's no right or wrong answer. There's no pass fail. I mean, it just is. Yeah. It just is what it is. And the more you're honest with yourself and look at what it is, the the more helpful it can be to you. Uh, you know, to really to make your life more like you want it to be. Yeah. You're not trying and, to be something that you're not type of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Be in your natural, be in your natural state. That's where you're going to win. That's where you're going to have the biggest impact and, and be of the most value to, to the world. So, so we want to enable that. So we're building awareness. So great. So now I know, and you know, there's some detail in there. If you look at the assessment and you look at the, the items you scored higher on or lower on, you can kind of see, uh, you know, we, we describe it as a two piece puzzle when we're trying to fit the two together. So you have sort of a shape to that edge of your puzzle mm -hmm. and everybody shapes different. So, so there could be somebody else out there, you know, my, my integrator score of 64, there could be someone else that has an integrator score of 64, their shape and the things they were higher, lower on completely different from mine. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so, so just because the number says a thing, it doesn't mean that the shape's exactly the same. So by knowing not only the level, so which way you're kind of, uh, you lean towards, but how that shape looks like it helps you fit with that proper complement. 
Okay. Uh, and, and you can kind of be aware and you get to kind of choose. So if there's something that you want to do, uh, even if it's not really what you're naturally wired to do, you can choose it, but just recognize that you're making a choice that's going to chew up more energy. It may drain you. It may drain you. It may drain you. And so, you know, you want to think about mm. you know, maybe differently about things that I have to do right now and maybe in a survival mode, but and think about long term. Do I want to be doing this for the long term or do I want to try to build a team around me, get folks around me uh, so that I can spend more and more of my time as we go in that natural state, in my you know unique ability again? Yeah. So how does that tension show up? You were talking about tension before between the integrator, visionary. How does that tension show up and what should people do to best work with the other Great. party? So it shows up many ways, <laughs> and 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 you know if you can think about uh, you know one of the words that the visionary least like least likes to hear is what the visionary uh, anything about details. Yeah, the, the the thing they least like to hear from somebody else is no, uh, because they've, <laughs> they've, they've got all these twenty ideas that week, and they're yeah. all great in their brain, right? And that so, must have drove you crazy with the negative, uh, the negative oh, guy, the thirteenth partner. Oh, oh, he must my. have just drove you insane. Well, that was that was extremely frustrating, <laughs> and you know, for 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 multiple reasons. Yeah. So you know, just just imagine, you know, you you're this fountain of of innovation and ideas and and you just feel like it's it's going nowhere but at the same time that same visionary this company this business in all likelihood is their largest asset and if they were to throw an idea in there that was a business killer yeah and they kill their largest asset yeah. so there's a there's a rational part of their brain yeah, yeah. that says you know what i need somebody to kind of help protect this from me yeah. But I need somebody that I can trust enough to to sort out and sift out, you know, the gold from the from the disaster. Right. And and so the the discipline, one of the main disciplines, we've got what we call the five tools and the five rules that we talk about in the yeah. book. So so one of the rules is something we call the the same page. I mean, you got to be on the same page. And so we give a structure for how that visionary and that integrator can have a have a dialogue to basically get everything out on the table and really kind of beat it up and talk about it to the point where they can get on the same page so that then when they go back out into the organization, mm -hmm. they're of one mind. And yeah. so the, the response that somebody in the organization gets from one of them will be very similar, if not exactly the same, they're going to get from the other one because they're synced up. They're always thinking uh, you know, in the same direction, in alignment, really on the same page. So, Mark, as an example of that, like let's say that how would that interaction go would it be the visionary just talking about all the ideas they had and then the um integrator shutting certain ones down but not shutting other ones down they decide to move forward or what does that conversation yeah, look so, like so so there's a there's a discipline using one of the tools around uh, core questions we have a handful of of core questions that you know as a foundational exercise they've got to nail those down and make mm -hmm. sure that they're on the same page about those and that yeah. really becomes your uh, you know your compass that you're going back to yeah. to check to see if we're if we're in alignment so so then in conjunction with the same page meeting the same page agenda is very very simple so it starts off with a a simple check-in so, uh, you know, we want the two of them to, to connect on a, on a human level. So, uh, you know, they're sharing, Hey, here's what's going on in my world, you know, good, bad, uh, personal business, but you know, we're in such a tight partnership. It's almost like a marriage. In fact, I have one of my clients, uh, the visionary calls his integrator, his business spouse. Yeah. And I mean, they're just really that tight of a relationship. And so, you know, you check in with each other and then you both have your, your list of issues. So you, you know, anything's fair game and the kind of stuff that should show up on the issue is, Hey, here's something here. I'm not sure we're on the same page about it anymore because this happened or that happened, or here's something new. I want to make sure we're on the same page about. So anything either one of them wants to talk about to make sure they're in sync with the other yeah. one, they put on that list and then they just prioritize the list and they just start. They try to pick the things that are most impactful, the things that they got to get to. Mm -hmm. And they just sit down and they just start working through and they go back and forth and make sure that they're in sync on what they're going to do. If they need to decide, they decide. If there's some follow-up action, they, they assign that. And they spend as much time, Jeremy, as they need to, to work through that whole list. And the commitment is really, we're not going to end this meeting until we're on the same page about everything on this list. Yeah. So it may take two hours. <laughs> it may take eight hours. I mean, we've right. got many examples of where a visionary integrator spent a whole day going through something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like um, probably what you go over with your high-level clients, this is the exact game plan you take them through, right? 
Yeah, so it's 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 very much like that. I mean, this is absolutely a core tool in the toolkit for for direct client work. Absolutely. So, how does that show up at home? Um, like, what should your wife be aware of that you're a visionary or an integrator? Your wife knows. Uh, <laughs> in, in all likelihood, they can they can kind of di- diagnose you. But right. uh, you know, I mean, I think there's 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 value in the discipline of just really the 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 strong communication. Uh, of things where, you know, I'm not clear that we're on the same page about it. Uh, you know, being able to, to have that, that conversation to get on the same page. Mm -hmm. There's another, you know, underlying theme here, uh, just around how people are different. So visionary and integrator, those are kind of macro level. So within that, there's tons and tons of differences, right? So I can take, you know, just because somebody's a visionary and integrator, they're still very, very different. And so the personalities involved, uh, you know, because of their uniqueness, we've got to understand as best we can those differences. So your pattern may be to process information in a certain way that to me seems like, wow, why would you do it that way? Yeah. Uh, and then and then you are kind of confused and surprised by the way that, that I do it. Again, we just don't realize that other people are different than we are. Mm-hmm. Once we're aware of it and we begin to understand those differences, though, I can come closer to your position. So if I know that if I give you the, you know, the, the five minute story that drives you insane because you just want me to get to the point, mm. I can try to be more concise and to the point and, and not drive you in the same. Likewise, you can know that I, my normal default is to tell a big, long story. And so you can know I'm not doing that to make you mad. That's just kind of how I think. And so you can be a little bit more forgiving. We try to meet halfway. Right, right. So in the book, you talk about the ratio of integrator to visionary. Why do you think it's four to one? I think you said it was four to one integrator to visionary. Why is it, is it, is the, I'm sorry, the visionary that's it's more prevalent to be a visionary? Yeah. So, uh, here's kind of the math. So yeah. if we look, if we look, uh, at the population in general, there's about 25% of the population that's wired, uh, to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Okay. So, but now the reality is only about 5% actually do. So there's a whole bunch of the population, you know, they could be, they kind of have the wiring, but for whatever reason, they're not exposed. Uh, you know, they don't have the opportunity. They just don't get in the right situation. They never do it. But then, you know, 5%, you know, they kind of pull the trigger and go. So if you think about those five, I put the integrator in that population just for kind of their pattern. Right. So four of them have sort of the classic archetypes of, of what a visionary would look like, but only one has that, that integrator kind of archetype. Yeah. And, and it's just, I mean, that's just the math. Yeah. That's just what we see. And, you know, as to why it's that way, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it's just a sort of special, it's almost an ability to live between two worlds. You know, the visionary lives in that extreme, uh, you know, innovation, future thinking, big picture, no detail kind of world, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff out there. And then there's this other world that is just pure execution uh, that doesn't, never looks up on the other end of the extreme. And the, the integrator lives kind of between, yeah. right? And so they've got to be able to hear this stuff that comes out of the visionary's head, translate it. Uh, sort it all out, organize it in some kind of a plan, and then feed it down into the rest of the organization or out into the rest of the organization so that they can execute and go. I mean, I think it's just a pretty special skill set. Yeah. Uh, it was a surprise to us to discover that that was the ratio. Yeah. And you know, my first thought was, wow, that's the scarce resource. The integrator is the scarce resource. Mm-hmm. We need more of them. We need to find them. And, and they're out there in these entrepreneurial companies, but we believe and actually are starting to see that there's also a number of them that are kind of, they're in big corporate. And so they're, they're hanging out in these, in these big corporate kind of roles right now, sort of lost. They're, they don't feel like they're at home there. Something doesn't, they don't feel quite like they fit. Right. People there look at them like they're a little bit crazy. Uh, and so it's just not a natural fit. And we want to find them. And, and let them know that, hey, we've got a bunch of visionaries out here in the entrepreneurial field that we can plug you into. And together, you guys can help another business, another company be wildly successful. What do people do with the, the assessment if, I don't know if this happens, if they don't, because I think the benchmark you say is 80, right? Yeah. Above 80, integrator, above 80, visionary. Yep. What if someone falls beneath on both of them? 
What are so they with that? we actually, I did a video on this called less than 80. Mm. So, you know, if you, if you sign up for our, our, our weekly emails or go to our, one of our YouTube channels or our YouTube channel, uh, you know, you can see this and some You're other like, just of, give up. No, I'm just, I'm just no. Yeah. Well, that's the feeling. Right? It's that <laughs> right. the initial, initial concern was, gee, it says I'm less than 80. So I'm not, and, and that's not it at all. It's, it's think of it like a spectrum. Uh, where, you know, higher is just more of it, right? And yeah. lower is just less of it. 80, if you're 80 or higher, it's kind of a, yeah, it's a, kind of a sure thing, right? right. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be true in any situation. But the other thing that we have to measure against is we call it the visionary spectrum for a particular business. So every business does not require the same amount of visionary energy. So if I have a company that's a high-tech company, so like one of my clients, they do uh, implants into your brain. Wow. Okay, so pretty high-tech, pretty fascinating yeah. stuff. So that business, that requires a lot of visionary. There's a lot of stuff going on there in that world that just requires a lot of visionary energy. So now I go all the way to the other end, and I have uh, you know, a business that's a trash company or a business that's in uh, you know rental uh, storage sheds. Okay, something that's just more more consistent, more mature, more stable. It's just not moving around as much. I mean, you see how those are really different? Yeah, yeah. So so part of the the assessment of, and the process on the front end is is you want to look at, okay, how much business is our, or how much visionary does our, our business really need? And so from that, view, right. if somebody's on the lower end of the visionary spectrum, their visionary score of, you know, 60 or whatever, maybe plenty. I mean, who knows? I mean, you just kind of have to assess that. I see that. what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so what was your take on Dan Cashel? You know, he interviewed it on Growth to Freedom. Yeah. And so he was doing most of the, the question asking. So you didn't get a chance to ask him back. Um, but he had said, I'm curious if you were surprised, not surprised. You know, Dan, um, he said that his integrator score was 62 and his visionary score was 92. Yeah. What were your th What was your thoughts about Dan and after hearing that or before? Yeah, so what was funny was when I first met and talked to Dan, he had not taken the assessment, so I didn't know. So all I knew was that he was in a role which I perceived as an integrator role with Joe. And and so right. I, I, I had that frame. Yeah, I see like Joe Polish was a visionary and Dan's yeah, in like right. an integrator so, so, so role. That, that, yeah. that was just kind of what I, what I thought I saw. And yeah. then I talked to him, right? So I first meet him and I'm like, hmm. <laughs> Okay, that's what I'm seeing here, and kind of the stuff that's coming out of his mouth. That doesn't look like what I would expect to see there. Uh, but you know, again, he hadn't done the assessments yet, and then sure enough, before our interview, he did the assessments, and I was like, okay, now yeah, that's that's the guy I talked to. That's hmm. that's what I saw when I when I talked to him. So it's sort of a, I think a light bulb has come on for for him, and just to, uh, again awareness of kind of you know, maybe he's doing some things that. Uh, you know, they're not necessarily his unique ability. You know, they take a little bit more energy and looking for ways to sort of structure his uh, his organization to to figure out the best way to to balance that out where he can spend more time working on the things that he that he loves the most and he's really the best at. Yeah. Yeah. Because I thought that was interesting, too, as well. Just seeing he, he seems. And then you talk about someone in your book who is almost equal on both. Yeah. So, so, uh, you know, we call it the kind of the, the, the combo. So yeah. I want you to know it's a very rare bird that really is both of them. And so they, they're strong on both the visionary and integrator, which means they're not only capable in both areas, but they actually enjoy yeah. both areas. So, uh, you know, from our, our sample, you know, it, it looks like it's about 5% of, of them are like this. So that's it. I mean, it's just not very many. And so sometimes we'll hear people say that, yeah, I think I'm both. And in reality, what they're saying is, I don't want to let go of that other stuff. Hmm. And so it's more about a control or a trust issue than it is about their capability. So we don't, we want to be careful that people don't use that as an excuse to kind of hang on and, and not embrace the model. But the reality is there's a very, uh, very small percentage of folks out there who actually are capable of doing both, at least for a while. And so maybe the company continues to grow and they can take it from that, you know, 2 million to, you know, 50 million. Uh, but, you know, even those tend to reach a point where they're really the, the dominant uh, trait starts to show and they start to feel the energy drain on the other side. And, and when they hit that point, uh, you know, they, they, they tend to gravitate towards their natural 
style, their natural wiring, and, and bring somebody in that can be strong on that other side to keep it keep it balanced out and keep it on the trajectory that they want. Yeah. So, Mark, there was like two sentences in the book that I felt was worth the entire book beyond and beyond. And I don't even want to, I want people to like actually see it. I don't even want to reveal it. It's so good, but I do want to reveal it because I want to hear your take on it. But there's this one question um, that gets talked about in the book about um, resolving disagreements. And I thought this was such a powerful portion. And it was about, um, are you going to, you know what I'm going to talk, you know what I'm, gonna, what I'm talking the, about? The, are, yeah, the, are you the question. To, yeah. This, can you talk about, this is, um, if for no other reason, this is like huge for a company, for a culture, for an individual, for business and for home, just nipping it in the bud before anything starts. Yeah. So, so, so here's the, the frame is it's a, a situation that we call an end run. So you've got your, your structure for the organization and an end run is when someone jumps around. Okay. So, you know, I'm supposed to go to the integrator. I'm accountable to the integrator, yeah. but instead I jump around the integrator and I go to the visionary uh, with my issue. So, you know, here's my uh, question or the decision I need or, or, or whatever. And they'll, that'll happen because, you know, maybe the integrator hasn't been there the whole time. So my habit is I've always gone to the vision. I've been, you know, reporting to this guy, accountable to this person for forever and ever. And so the habit is, is ingrained. So now we introduce this integrator sort of in between. Yeah. So if the visionary says, okay, and they, and they sort of give direction, they solve the problem, they answer the, the situation, they make the decision, you know, whatever it might be, then you can imagine what that does to the integrator. It effectively cuts them off at the knees. It totally inhibits yeah. their ability to be effective uh, and, and really undoes this thing the visionary is trying to do by putting the integrator in place. Right. So what we want the visionary to do is identify what's going on. So see it. Oh, yeah. That, that, this person should have gone to the integrator with that question or for that direction. They've come to me. It's okay to listen and kind of, you know, be a human and, and kind of hear what they have to say, but stop short of answering and giving direction. And what we want them to do is ask what we call the question. Yeah. And the question is simply this, okay, I've heard you. Uh, and now, you know, I have one question for you. And the question is simply this, are you going to tell them or am I? Meaning, are you going to go tell the integrator this or should I go tell them because one of us needs to tell them? Mm-hmm and leave it there, okay? And what we see is within the course of about 30 days of, of using the question to, to stop or blunt any end runs that are attempted, they go away. And, and that behavior really just, it disappears from your organization. Yeah, I love that part. I think this so applies to everything, yeah. It, it, it does, I mean, send them back to, to the place where they should be going with that issue. And, you know, the other side of the end run situation is as a visionary, the visionary also has habits and their habits are to go down into the organization and give direction, right? So they don't wait for them to come to them. They'll go down into the organization, going around the integrator, making an end run around the integrator. And they start telling people what to do. They start monkeying with stuff. I call it tampering. So they go down there and they start tampering and that can have a very detrimental uh, impact on, you know, what the integrator is trying to orchestrate and the, the harmony that they're trying to, to put in place, the coordination they've got going, all the reasons that you've got them in there doing that. Uh, don't jump around them and tamper. You'll really, uh, you know, pull the team back and, and, and uh, you know, knock it off the rails if you're yeah. not careful. So, Mark, I always ask, since it's Inspired Insider, what's been the lowest point? in business for you and how you push through? So, uh, I mean, the, the lowest point I can remember that one, when we, when we shut down cyber explore, that was a, uh, uh, you know, that was a pretty low point. Um, and, and the thing that pushed me through that was really, I was, I was learning a lot. So I was very optimistic. And even though it felt like the, the walls were crumbling down around me, uh, I had, I had gotten a tremendous amount from that experience. And I just had this, this feeling inside that, uh, you know, that learning, that knowledge was going to, to help me, 
you know, do that next thing. Help me, uh, you know, not make those same mistakes in the past, but actually open up more doors, more pathways, more uh, opportunities for me to, you know, explore and, and, and kind of build on in the future. And so I think that that future view, not the just kind of stuck in the now uh, or, or the looking back and thinking about what could have been, but just look at all the nuggets I picked up, all the gold yeah. I picked up. Uh, in the process, uh, I don't remember, uh, you know, getting the dark cloud uh, that you know, I logically, rationally should have maybe had at that mm. point in time. So right after that happened, were you just right back thinking of what else you should do or did you need a little time? Yeah. So so the way it happened, I mean, I literally was in operation mode uh, for how to sell all that stuff. I mean, so we had the the logistics of this big Internet uh, online auction. Yeah. And do you still uh, have we, pictures of the yeah. of the space. Yeah. Yeah, it was cool. Uh, I want to post yeah. one on, on the bottom yeah, of this see, if you I'll have them. If, yeah. I'll see if I can find one. I'll see yeah. if I can find Somewhere there's videos. Somewhere there's videos of the uh, like news VHS, group. probably. Yeah, like, probably. I don't know if they're still. They may have melted by now. <laughs> but you know, for, for the, the 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 news crew would come through and do an interview uh, mm. of me or whatever on site. So there's some yeah. of that footage out there. Um, but yeah, so so you know, I was busy. Uh, I mean, I was never uh, kind of stalled for something to do. So I was busy in great. How do we? How do we wind this down and and uh, and go through that? And then I quickly. I mean, it was very, very short time gap before I was in that uh, entrepreneur in residence role with Amico. So it's like almost immediately I really? went from, you know, when we landed that one mm -hmm. to boom, I was on into the next thing. And it, it was a nice blend for my transition because it kind of, for my wife's benefit, it had the security of, right. okay, he's got a job, but it had the, uh, you know, feed my entrepreneurial appetite uh, kind of nature too. So that's not yeah. a, that was a pretty rare uh, and special opportunity that I got to do that. Yeah. So on the flip side, what's been one of the proudest business moments? One of the proudest business moments. So, um, there's been a lot of those. I, you can say I, more than one if you want. Well, I'll, I'll tell you one of the, the coolest ones was, uh, you know, that the, the prediction analytics business, when we sold that. Yeah. Uh, so, so the way that deal went down, uh, you know, I told you it took a really long time to do it and, uh, it was supposed to close on a certain date and I had a vacation schedule to take my kids to Disney world on the, on the other side of that date. Well, it ends up dragging out big mm. surprise, takes longer. And so we literally end up, I'm at Disney world trying to finalize this deal. I'll never forget. I, the kids are on the Dumbo ride going around and around and I'm, I've got my cell phone up to my ear, my finger in the other ear, and I've been over a park bench trying to work out the final details on a like a 401k plan transitioning because the hurricane came in and all the documents got mm -hmm. blown away, something crazy like that. But it finally closed. And so uh, about halfway through the week, I'm sitting in the hotel room in bed uh, with my wife. I've got my laptop open and I see the money move into the account mm. and I know it's done. And it's, 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 it's all done. All that work, all that build up, the creation of value, the finally closing the deal. And it happened. So everybody won mm. that was involved in that. The whole team won. And then I was able to just shut mm. the computer, turn off the phone, put that stuff all away. Didn't, you know, didn't answer the phone for, you know, for the rest of the time. So that felt really great. So how do you celebrate that once that happens? What do you do? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the celebration there was with the, was with the family. Yeah. And then you know, we had another celebration when we got back to the, to the town and, and could be together with the team. Love that. Yeah. yeah. A lot of hard work, long nights, I'm sure. That's right. That's right. I mean, and some of the things that my team did, our team did, I mean, we were just absolutely insane. Uh, you know, the coming back from, you know, what looked like the thing that would put us out of business countless times, yeah. I mean, not countless, but, you know, maybe six or seven times you'd think, wow, you know, that thing that could kill us. And then they would figure out a way the team would figure out some kind of, you know, way just kind of out of nowhere to, to navigate the maze. And, and we come out the other side and keep going. And, and those moments are really proud. Really so proud how moments. long of hours were you working at the time? Oh it seems like some crazy technology, even oh now, gosh. back then. Yeah. So uh, the, the crazy thing, Jeremy, is my fuel used to be Diet Coke and peanut M&Ms. Really? Oh, yeah. 
And so I literally would have in my desk drawer, I'd have, you know, a bag of peanut M&Ms, like a three pound bag. I like those. M&Ms. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I would be drinking, I'd drink a 12 pack or more of Diet Coke a day. Wow. Holy yeah. cow. I would be, I would go for, you know, 24, 48 hour runs. I mean, just stretches without sleep. So I would just Are you go, serious? Holy yeah. moly. And, and so, you know, that's just sort of back then, and I'm not that way anymore by, you know, intent, uh, but I, I was kind of a sprinter, right? So I would go until I hit the wall, and boom, then I would crash, and I'd have to kind of recover and then come back, and I would just push and push and push and push and push. And I could do that over, you know, kind of a, uh, kind of a meta arc. And, uh, you know, that was just all kind of part of the startup, startup routine. Yeah. So now, you know, I don't do that. Now I don't. I don't pull all nighters now. I don't. I don't live on M and M's uh, and and Diet Coke. <laughs> thankfully, how'd you even survive on that? Yeah, it was crazy. You know, it was weird. I would lose weight too. You figure that one out. I I would I would drink Diet Coke and peanut M and M's by the pound and lose weight in the process. Maybe it's I a new diet. It. Yeah, I mean it's <laughs> the it's Mark totally C. Insane. Winters diet. Yeah, forget you know, paleo. I, just drink Diet Coke and peanut exactly. M and M's. The problem with drinking that much Diet Coke, though, is you can't stop or you'll have the headache of all headaches. Really? Oh, the caffeine withdrawals are brutal from that. Wow. So what about mentors? Yeah. Who have been some of your mentors and some great advice? So uh, early on, uh, you know, when I was in the Procter & Gamble Army, mm-hmm. I had a great, uh, a great mentor uh, that he was a Marine Corps major. He got, he got actually, when he's coming out of college at Wake Forest, he was drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers to play football. Yeah. He was drafted by the Pittsburgh Pirates to play baseball. And he was drafted by the U.S. Marine Corps to go to Vietnam. And so that's where he went. And wow. uh, he, he, was, uh, he was one of my, my managers at Procter & Gamble. And he just taught me a lot about, about leadership and how to, uh, you know, how to work in a team, uh, how to navigate uh, you know, kind of the different agendas that other people can have uh, in business. And just, I think, a lot of wisdom uh, when I was really young uh, for, for kind of thinking, thinking further down the road. So, so, so that's, that's one of them. Uh, the, the guy that was my, my partner in the prediction, the rocket scientist, yeah. uh, you know, he was a mentor in a lot of ways. And, you know, a lot of wisdom in, uh, in different things that he, he told me through the years. And, uh, you know, just again, on how to, how to deal with people, how to think bigger, uh, you know, and really, and really see the future and look at the, uh, you know, look at the landscape for, for what's next. Um, you know, Gino, uh, he, he's been a fantastic mentor. Uh, you know, Gino, I give, I give a tremendous amount of credit for allowing me to kind of get out of the, you know, kind of that startup, uh, you know, full on dial turn to 11 all the time mode to to more of a mode where i i have way more control over how i spend my time and and the percentage of my time that i spend in my unique ability that lcd that i talked about before yeah it's a extremely high percentage and i don't you know except for a rare interview that uh, you know that i may do at sort of an odd hour i mean you know nights and weekends i'm with family i yeah. mean that's that's free time and so i've got way more structure and control over my time yeah. than i've ever had before and i give him a lot of credit for that so what's gino's score assessment you know i don't know uh i mean if you you probably know like as far as just uh, qualitatively yeah, so not here's here's way. what i would tell you is yeah. i think i think he's one of those rare both oh really yep and uh you know i think he's i think he is uh pretty high on both of the indexes and uh in in my my working relationship with him i can see that his integrator uh score is is definitely going to be higher than mine um but you know the visionary conversations the conversations that he and i get to have like that are they're extremely fun and uh, we both get a lot of energy out of that uh so in fact we were in actually we were in your town last week oh yeah okay yeah and got to spend a little time, uh, uh, you know, one night uh, kind of playing, playing future and, and thinking out on the horizon. And, uh, I mean, it was just, it was just fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. So I have one last question, Mark. Thank you so much for your time on this. This is very valuable. Um, before I ask it, where can we point people towards? I know you mentioned rocketfuelnow.com. Um, they can check out on Amazon, Rocket Fuel and Audible. Anywhere else that we should point people towards to check out? <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, so for the book, it's available everywhere. Yeah. Uh, you know, and check out the the Audible edition for sure. Uh, you know, the if you want to track any information down on Rocket Fuel, RocketFuelNow.com is the place. Uh, the there's a Rocket Fuel channel on YouTube. Uh, you're going to be able to get to that yeah. through the website. There's a lot of good find, like three minute videos that you yeah, do. I, yeah. I try to put out a, yeah. a three minute video every week that basically is uh, it's triggered by questions we're getting from the community. So we have a, a private group. So folks that, uh, that that own the book that want to talk to each other, there's really interesting conversations going on in that private group. We actually have people uh, posting. This is interesting, Jeremy. So they're, they're starting to match up, right? So yeah. we'll have integrators that come in there and they sort of raise their hand and say, hey, I'm an integrator looking for a visionary. We have visionaries going, hey, I'm a visionary looking for an integrator. And we are actually having matches made inside hmm. that community, which is fascinating to me. What are they looking uh, for just to like start a company or what? Yeah, so so it literally, it's a, it's a visionary that has a company, has a business. They've read the book. They're like, "Gee, I want an integrator." So yeah. they they just use that group as a channel because there's all kinds of integrators in there yeah. uh, and visionaries in there. They just use that as another part of their connection process to try yeah. and put the word out and 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 see if they can find somebody there that's going to be yeah. their match. Yeah. So there's two things to end on, Mark. One. Um, I need to hear the future, what you see, what you're up to, what, you know, if I can be a fly on the wall in you and Gino's conversation. But uh, the second thing is the, um, I want you to talk about first is the influence. Your dad has a really interesting story and inf influence on you. Can you talk a little about what he did and uh, his influence? Yeah, so uh, my father was a uh, physician, family doctor. I, you know, I, I tell people if they're old enough to have ever watched Marcus Welby, that was dad. Right. And, uh, you know, he, he had these wonderful relationships with his patients. He took care of multiple generations in a, in a single family. So, yeah. you know, he would, he would deliver the kids and then he would end up delivering their kids and maybe even wow. that next generation's That's kids. Yeah. He's delivered probably thousands of, of babies over the course of his career. Uh, and, and what was funny, he, the people would, after they were delivered, uh, they'd bring pictures to me. He used to have these massive, frames, just all these pictures of all these kids that he had delivered before there was digital photography right? or, or, you know, I mean, so there's all, all literally prints anyway, you know, he, he had that, uh, as a caregiver. And, and so he had this, this deep relationship with his patients and, you know, medicine has changed. Healthcare has changed. And so fast forward, uh, to my older brother, who's a physician and the world that he's got to live in is a much more transaction oriented world, right? So he doesn't have those, those kinds of long-term relationships. The, the landscape doesn't allow for it. Yeah. And so the pressure in healthcare away from that, it creates this really, really kind of funky, uh, dynamic. And so I look at the healthcare landscape, having grown up with what it used to be like, and then yeah. I look at what it's like today and I find it extremely frustrating and frustrating as a, as a user. So, you know, I'm always looking for opportunities. I think healthcare is a very uh, rich field of opportunity that is totally jacked up yeah. and it's absolutely huge. And so, yeah. you know, we, we work on some things that are trying to uh, sort of level the playing field, if you will. If you think about the major players of the physicians, uh, you know, the, the, the hospitals, the insurance companies, and then the employers that are involved. All four of those parties are, are, are pretty deeply involved in the landscape. And it's really been driven uh, of late by the insurance companies and the big hospitals. Yeah. And so the physicians are getting squashed down. They're totally uh, at the mercy of those other big players. And so you know we're exploring solutions that put them back right. in control of that. They, they touch the majority of the money that flows through the system. If we can put them in a place where they can control that and direct that, not only for the good of the patient right. uh, and the quality of care, but for the good of the overall system, uh, you know, we've got an opportunity yeah. to really change the game there. Yeah. And what, is, what does Mark do? He creates a software company to do that. So we didn't even talk about <laughs> the Revelation MD, which you uh, started to, um, that kind of works to solve this problem. Yeah, so you know, I can't take credit for starting that one on my own. I'm a mm -hmm. co-founder, but there's some so you know, really good team that have a really wonderful vision uh, around that opportunity yeah. as well. But yeah, that's that's my personal connection to yeah. that to that whole project. Is uh, you know, I mean, it's it's really yeah. come a long way from where it, where it used to be, and uh, it needs to change. Yeah. So on the future side of things, 
what's exciting to you? What what can you tell us about uh, what you're working on lately and in the future? So a lot of work around uh, the rocket fuel offering, and, and really, you know, we want to help solve the problems that uh, that the entrepreneurs value most. I I get up in the morning. Uh, because I care about the entrepreneur and, and I want them to you know, experience the freedom that they were after when they started that business in the first place, right? So I, you heard some of these stories about businesses I started and I landed in a totally different place than what I was shooting for. Uh, I didn't get that freedom that I wanted every time, but there are times when I've gotten it, you know, freedom of, of, of money, freedom of time, freedom to work with the folks I enjoy, freedom to make the difference I want to make in the yeah. world. So if we can use that rocket fuel combination to make that happen, I want more of that. So the book is helping people learn about, uh, you know, the possibility there. We're looking at solutions that help them get together, help them get paired up, help them get matched with their uh, integrator or visionary counterpart, as the case may be, and make that relationship great. So we've got some uh, you know, some training offerings that we're working on. We want to help basically create great integrators that can work with these visionaries and help make these companies go. And so that's really the next thing. The next thing is, is the set of tools, the set of programs that an integrator can go through that will prepare them and then help us match them up to make more of these businesses winners. Yeah. Mark, I'm going to be the first one to thank you so much. Everyone should check out rocketfuelnow.com been an absolute pleasure thank you so much love it jeremy thank you man good to, good to talk to you yeah what i got you can't buy it resides between my eyes walk through the fire came out better on the other side see lights like a beach if you find the sand right now i'm feeling like a hundred grand 